Well, you're most welcome to this talk and a, a special welcome to Senator Gerard uh, Rennick from Australia. Senator, welcome and thank you for coming on the programme. Hi, John. It's great to be here and thanks for having me back on. And I know it's the end of a busy working day for you, so we're very, we're very grateful. Now, the first question I have, Senator, is that I'm just looking at this excess de deaths data from, from Australia here. And we see that the deaths in Australia started going up in May 2021 got higher in June, July, August, September, October, until in October there were 7,192 deaths. Now, this is in 2021. Now, correct me if I'm wrong here, but the Australia Vaccine Programme began in the February 2021, and COVID didn't really kick off in Australia until 2022. Um Two questions here, really. The first is, I expect the success deaths is, is front page news on all the newspapers and everyone's clamouring to work out why it is. And uh, the, the, the second is, what do we think is causing this? What are the possible range of factors? So first of all, is this making the news? Are, are, the, are the mainstream media all over this story? No, they're not. Uh, and they weren't over the story in 2021. And, and the reason why I think it's worth looking at 2021 uh, rather than 2022 is because COVID was in the community in 2022 and it's been very easy to conflate the excess deaths with COVID. Now, you know, I, I do think that some of the excess deaths were due to COVID. However, I don't think that the majority of the excess deaths were due to COVID, uh, which is, and, and the reason why I say that is when I look at the 2021 data, the excess deaths did start to climb in May. Now, the vaccine program only really started to kick off in late March. So given that the ABS has a bit of a time delay in reporting, and for many people, you know, they don't necessarily die in the first day after a vaccine injury. It may take a number of days or weeks. Mm. I think mm. there's a very strong temporal association between the rollout of the COVID vaccine and the increase in deaths in Australia. And what's interesting is, is that by the end of 2021, we had about an extra 9,000 deaths. So deaths jumped from... Uh, 162,000 to 171,000. Now, it's worth noting that in 2020, deaths were 164, six, no, 2019, deaths were 164,000. So the lockdowns reduced the death rate uh, by about 2,000 in 2020. Um, and then it jumped about 9,000 in 2021. So we can't put the excess deaths down to the lockdowns and delayed doctor reactions and things like that. Maybe a part of the climb in excess deaths, but not all of it. Uh, and what's interesting is too, is in that, that increase of 9,000, that happened from April, May onwards, that it started to spike mm. and it wasn't in the first four months. So if that was extrapolated for the whole year, that would work out at about 12,000 extra deaths or almost a jump of 10% in that year, despite the fact there was no next to no COVID in the community. Mm hmm I mean, we remember that there were small outbreaks in Victoria, but there was lockdowns and they were closed down. So there was essentially no COVID in 2021 in Australia. That's I've right. Just got the fig I've yeah. got the figure, Senator, in front of me here. It's 10,392 excess deaths in Australia in 2021. And bear in mind, this is a population of what, 26, 27, 26.5 million. Yeah, yeah, about 25 and a half million in 2021. Yeah. yeah. Why is it that... I mean, imagine 10,000 people have been killed in a terrorist attack. This would be like massive news around the world. Why isn't this being reported in Australia? Well, well I mean, uh, that's, that's the $64 million question, John. And, the, you know, I can only speculate as to the answer why, but I suspect it doesn't suit uh, the government or, or the media mm. uh, or, or the health authorities uh, in the private sector, big pharma and things like that to actually investigate further because I can't see that there's any other reason other than the rollout of the COVID vaccines. Now, I'm not saying it's responsible for every excess death. I do think that, um, you know, the lockdowns may have had some response to it. Uh, in 2021, there were about 1,300 deaths from COVID. In 2020, there were about 980. So COVID deaths did increase by about 300, but yet again, a long way short of the extra 10,000 in excess deaths. Yeah. And what's also very interesting about these numbers is that the largest increase or in, in the death rate were, was in Western Australia and Queensland, the two states where there were no lockdowns uh, and there was no COVID or, or, you know, very few cases of COVID. And if they were there, they were in people in quarantine. So yet again, you know, the, the data would indicate that it was a result of the vaccine rollout rather than COVID itself. 
I think I think all of Australia, but as you say, Queensland and Western Australia are a particularly useful model because, as you say, that th- there was no COVID in in that time period. So the cause of deaths must be something other than COVID that's, infection per se. That's exactly right, and we've got two strong uh, indicators there. One is obviously the temporal association between the rollout and and the, and the jump in excess deaths, uh, and the geographic location of the excess deaths. Uh, and I should add a third one as well, was the large increase, and this is something you touched on in a recent video, in adverse events. Uh, and not just you know, not just adverse events, but the rate of adverse events. So as you, you probably uh, touched on in one of your recent interv- uh, uh, mm. uh, programs last week, was that the death rate, uh, uh, sorry, the injury rate, sorry, from the vaccine rollout in West Australia was 264 uh, injuries per 100,000 doses versus a normal rollout, I think, of 11.1. So so a jump of 24 or 2,400%, which was huge. Uh, and one thing you, you didn't touch on, and, I'll, and I will touch on this now, is in page Please. 11 in that vaccine injury report, 47% of those people who reported a vaccine injury actually went to emergency, and it, or 48%, I think it was, uh, and another 9% were actually admitted to hospital overnight. So all up, 57% of people went to hospital as a result of their vaccine injury. Now, I can, I, I'm pretty sure I can speak for a lot of Australians. We generally won't go to hospital uh, for something that we consider mild, and we'll only go to hospital if we feel like it's an emergency. Yeah. So, so the report, you, this is the report here that we're talking about. It's the official report from the Western Australian authorities and uh, it, it, it is a very detailed report now uh, of the adva- adverse events reported following immunization that took place in western australia what percentage of those overall adverse events that occurred would you imagine actually got through into the report are people good at reporting in australia because in the uk it's actually quite a low percentage well, well yet again that that's something that we don't know of um I, I suspect it's a very low percentage um but I, I can't be sure i can only speculate now i i uh, have a friend who's a cardiologist here in queensland he submitted three myocarditis reports to queensland health and they sent them back to him saying the patients must go back to their gp and get the gp to lodge the myocarditis reports on behalf of the patient not the cardiologist so uh, that, that would indicate that the Queensland Health Department, at the very least, were doing their best to downplay or not report uh, vaccine injuries. And I've had a number of antidotal stories whereby people who had a vaccine injury, when they, you know, or, or you know, when they either went to the hospital or saw their GP, that they were told verbally that their injury was caused by the vaccine, yet they would not write it down. Nor the doctor at the GP clinic, nor, nor the nurse or whoever it was at the registration desk would write down it's a vaccine injury. And in many cases, they wouldn't necessarily hand out the, 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 the injury report from the hospital. The hospital wouldn't hand that over to the particular patient. So it would be underreported at the very least. So the culture in healthcare in Australia really was not to report vaccine injuries, or the, it's almost like there was pressure not to report vaccine injuries. Am I going too far to say there was pressure not to report them? No, I don't think you are with the COVID vaccines. I, I can't speak, talk to, talk to other vaccines and the history of, of, of mm. other vaccines. I suspect, you know, like all things, you know, other people have probably had vaccine injuries in the past and didn't report mm. them. Um, and I can't, you know, look, I can't comment on that. But I, I've had, you know, a large number of people that I've spoken to, and I've spoken to a lot of people over the last 18 months, say that, you know, their injury wasn't written down as a vaccine injury. I've also had a Queensland Health employee uh, come to me uh, and say that she was sacked uh, effectively because she was told by a doctor uh, to take off the fact that a 38-year-old pregnant woman uh, died a day after receiving the vaccine. And, and she was told she was a clerk, administrator clerk, uh, who kept the record of all the details and she was told to remove the fact that she was vaccinated from her, from her record. Um, and she's had to move in a state. Uh, so they're, they're some of the stories that I've been told uh, throughout this period, which is just, you know, just disgusting. And I've also right. been contacted. Yes, yeah. I mean, we talk about these numbers, but when you get to the individuals at the end of the day like that, it really does have an impact. Oh, absolutely. And and that's, that's you know, unfortunately the least of it because many people who've been injured have had their injuries gaslighted and they haven't been able to get mm. proper medical support, number one. 
Uh, and number two, they haven't been able to get financial support for their loss of income because they can't work, uh, which I think is even more dreadful, which, of course, then leads to the mental health issues of being unsure, how you're going to pay, mm. pay your mortgage off. I've mm. spoken to a number of people that you know, have not been able to go back to their jobs as a result of their injury. Uh, and I've actually had 432 people contact me as a result of a post I put up on Facebook asking for people who were sacked as a result of not taking a second shot after being injured by their first one. And, and 432 people contacted me. So, yeah, it's not just people who've been injured who've been gaslighted uh, and bullied. Mm -hmm. It's it's people who don't want a, a second uh, a, take, a, take a vaccine mm -hmm. at all, um, regardless of their... Their, their status uh, and I thought we lived in a free pluralistic society here where you know free will yeah. meant be counted for something uh, but clearly it doesn't yeah and this is presumably just in your constituency constituency area in Queensland this is a small segment of Australia well, well it, it's Queensland and Australia I'm, I'm contacted by people across right, okay. Australia um, mm -hmm. obviously because I'm in federal parliament and you know I'm not going to sort of try and not help people from other states just because I only deal with people in Queensland. But no, so I have been contacted by people across the country. Yeah. Right. Yeah, slightly different system to the UK. In Western Australia in 2020, there was just over 2 million doses of what we might call traditional pre-COVID vaccines given to the population as a whole. And out of this two, over 2 million doses of traditional vaccines, there were 270 reports of adverse reactions. So that's 270 out of over, over 2 million. Yeah. Now, there was just under 4,000 COVID vaccines given in 2021, so r roughly twice as many COVID vaccines as traditional vaccines of the year before. Yeah, 4 million. 10, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it was 9.3 million, so just under 4 million. And there was 10,726. Yeah. So if it had been proportional, we would have expected about 550 adverse reactions from the COVID vaccines. Yeah. We actually got well we got nearly eleven thousand, which was ninety seven percent of the reports following COVID were following COVID vaccines. What do you think this tells us about the frequency of adverse events following COVID vaccines compared to traditional vaccines? Well well it, it tells us that you know the COVID vaccines you know are, are causing a lot more injuries than a traditional vaccine. Step one. Mm -hmm. Uh and step two, we had about ten million cases of COVID in Australia by September twenty twenty two. Uh, nine months after we opened up the international borders and the state borders, uh, which was half the almost half the vaccinated population. Now, I've never had mumps, measles, or rubella like any of the childhood vaccinations you get. You, you know, not many people catch that particular disease afterwards, and yet here we are with people who've been uh, given you know two shots at the least, if not boosters, you know, multiple shots, catching COVID on a, on, on at least once, if not twice. Um, mm -hmm. So not only has it got a higher injury rate, it seems to not have worked at all in the first place, which was to stop, you know, the whole point of a preemptive or a prophylactic is to preempt, you know, and prevent the disease. Uh, and the whole definition of the vaccine has been changed. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the, the precise data we've got here is from Western Australia. I mean, are we being unreasonable to extrapolate this into the whole population of Australia? Or is that, do you think this is rep very, fairly representative of Australia as a whole? Well, it's all we've got to work with. Um, so, and Western Australia represents about 10% of the population. So it's a large sample uh, mm. and it's very significant because Western Australia was the last state to open up its borders yeah. to the rest of the world. So 2021 was a clean year. It'll be interesting to see the 2022 data uh, mm. once we include uh, the boosters because I know a lot of people got the first two shots and, and came out of it okay, but it was the, it was the boosters that yeah. actually... Uh, yeah. you know, cause the injury. So it would be interesting to see how many injuries are going to be reported in 2022. Uh, and I have to commend the Western Australian government for actually releasing that point, mm. report because many other state governments didn't. Um, the only other data that I am aware of uh, is in regards to cardiac presentations at emergency. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's been collected by a few different uh, people that have contacted me. Uh, so I've got data there for South Australia, Victoria and Queensland. And cardiac presentations uh, for younger people skyrocketed in April, November 2021 uh, in all of those three states. Now, two of those states, South Australia and Queensland, didn't have COVID at that time. And Victoria had some COVID around that August period, but not later in the year or, or much less later in the year. So that's also a very strong signal uh, that would indicate that the vaccine was causing uh, heart complications or myocarditis, mm -hmm. pericarditis, to be more specific.
Australia is actually this natural experiment, isn't it? Just waiting for people to start analysing this and, and, and getting, getting to some conclusions. Now, th th this Western Australian report here, uh, it was six months late, but I was actually impressed by the candour uh, in the report. Um, it, it, it does seem pretty straight talking. Why haven't the other states produced something similar? That's a good question, John, and I can only speculate again uh, because I'm not you know, involved with the health departments in those states, but you know, it, it doesn't suit them to release the data uh, is the only, only reason I can think of. I mean, it is now midway through 2023. Uh, and I don't see why it takes up to 18 months. Well, well, yeah, up to 18 months to release that data. Yeah. So the total report of adverse events uh, following COVID vaccines uh, was uh, 264 per 100,000 doses for the traditional vaccines in Western Australia, where we have this precise data. So um, dur during the same 2021 time frame, there were 11.1 .1 events per 100,000 doses. Whereas with the COVID vaccines, as we've said, it was over over 10,000 doses, over 10,000 adverse reactions. Why didn't this come up as a red flag at the time? Why didn't, why didn't the authorities almost, I mean, surely the authorities should have been monitoring this in live time and said, just a minute, there's a problem here. Why didn't that happen? Uh, because they didn't want to stop the rollout. Uh, and I can, I can speak personally to that because I went to see the health minister at the time, Greg Hunt. Uh, I advised him of a large number, I was contacted by a large number of constituents in particular, young constituents had, who had serious side effects from the vaccine, and I'm talking mm -hmm. uh, paralysis, uh, clots, uh, strokes, um, you know, uh, uh, tremors. I've, I've, I've got a long list, Senator. Anaphylaxis, yeah. thrombosis with yeah. thrombocytopenia, immune thrombocytopenia, pupira, guillain barry myocarditis, pericarditis, myocarditis, chest pain, deep venous thrombosis. We could go on. There was a long list in, in, in this report. And, and again just alarming to me that that didn't come up as a red flag exactly especially when it was in young healthy people who had yep. no prior uh, existing conditions and mm. yeah very shortly afterwards then had serious adverse events now you know maybe they weren't all caused by the vaccine but there was enough you know there was enough high enough injury rate to be a red flag to the tga mm. they should have acted on it mm. and they didn't uh and you know the greg the, the health minister at the time greg hunt should have you know, press the TGA. He should have picked up the phone to them and said, I've got a senator here who says he's been yeah. contacted by a large number of constituents. Yeah. Uh, you said this vaccine was safe and effective. We've got state governments forcing people to take these jabs uh, or they lose their job. Is it safe effective and, and effective, yes or no? And can you get to the bottom of why these injuries are occurring? And the, t the head of the TGA at the time, John Skerritt, pretty much gaslighted and dismissed most of the injuries. Uh, he kept saying, well, we've got to look at the background rate. So here's the irony. He was saying, well, people get these type of injuries every day. And yes, they probably do. Uh, and he kept saying, well, we've got to look at the background rates. Well, you know, we've now got the background rates, or at least from Western Australia. And they would indicate that uh, the injury, the COVID vaccine had a much higher injury rate uh, than other vaccines. And the question needs to be asked, as you said, why didn't the TGA monitor this data in real time? And why wasn't it you know, you know, corresponding with the state governments uh, to get this data out quicker? Um, and, and effectively stopped a rollout, as far as I'm concerned, at the very least for younger people, younger, healthy people of working age population who had very low risk from uh, uh, COVID. I'm not saying there was no risk, um, but, you know, that, that never happened. And, and the argument they will put forward is, is that, you know, the risk from the COVID is still worse than the risk from the vaccine. I, I dispute that. And that's for the reasons we discussed in our prior interview, whereby they did code on optimization, extended the poly A tail, uh, introduce transfection, um, et cetera, et cetera, into the vaccine, which in, in my view increased the risk of the vaccine greatly, um, especially since a lot of this stuff hadn't been tested in humans on a longitudinal basis. So, um, uh, you know, so yet again, the benefit of the doubt for that very reason as well, the fact that testing hadn't been thorough, they should have uh, pulled up stumps the moment they saw such a high injury rate. Yep. Now, I assume, I assume the COVID vaccination programs essentially stop now in Australia. Is it, is it just high risk groups that are currently getting vaccinated or? It, it is high risk groups. Um, so they they no longer recommend the vaccine. I need to be careful about this. I don't think they recommend the vaccine for people under 60. They do yeah, for people yeah. over 60, but they still yeah. encourage it. I think it's fair to say they encourage right, okay. you still get your yeah, shots. Yeah. Uh, and they're now pushing the influenza vaccines uh, 
very hard as well. And I don't know, they're not mRNA vaccines. My understanding is they're not mRNA vaccines. Um, I, I'm not, I don't know enough about the, the safety of the, inf, the current influenza vaccines yeah. being used. Uh, there my, are the traditional type of antigen yeah. vaccines. It's a yeah. completely different category yeah. of vaccine. Yeah, I mean, look, my only uh, word of caution in regards to that, though, is you don't want to over um, vaccinate people um, for reasons I know that Robert Clancy's touched on in the past is that, you know, you can get immune imprinting or original antigenic sin whereby, mm. you know, you'll get your antibodies, will respond to the prior infection and not the current infection. So mm -hmm. um, that may still be a risk, I think, even mm -hmm. with non-mRNA vaccines, um, if yeah. you over vaccinate. But mm -hmm. I, I don't know enough to know, like maybe one shot a year is enough. But if you were going to get three shots in one year, do you start risking, um, you know, having an immune uh, reaction to prior variants rather than the existing variant? Which is a good question for the immunologist rather than the uh, big pharma salesman, I would have thought. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, um, given that we are, all we know now about the mRNA vaccines, how concerned are you about the huge new factory that's been built in Australia to build a, to develop a hundred new, a hundred million doses of mRNA vaccines a year in um, in Melbourne? Is it? I think it's Melbourne. Well, I'm incredibly concerned about that because that will become a hammer looking for a nail. Because you know, once these vaccines are produced, they've got to go into people's arms, or the money gets wasted. So there will be a lot of uh, marketing and, and lobbying pressure put on the government by Big Pharma who've invested all this money uh, to justify the cost and get a, and get a return on their um, investment for their shareholders. Um, so that concerns me greatly. But, of course, the other thing that also can, can, concerns me greatly is that a lot of people want to move on and just forget about COVID um, and not sure. just the vaccines, but the whole reaction to COVID right from the initial mm. lockdowns, the lockdowns, mm. the lockups, the lockouts, mm. uh, the daily press conferences, the misinformation, the bullying, um, the cruel and inhumane methods used by governments, by media, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Um, and this is even before we got to the vaccine rollout. Mm. Uh, mm. And then, of course, we had the vaccine rollout, which was multiplied again, uh, whereby people were forced to take a vaccine that hadn't been thoroughly tested that was a blanket uh, mandate. So, for example, you know, I, I, I've got a son who's allergic to penicillin. I've got another son who's allergic to pecans and walnuts. And I've got a daughter who's allergic to nickel. Um, now, you know, just because my son's allergic to penicillin doesn't make me an anti-penicilliner. But, you know, for my son, he can't take penicillin. So if there was some sort of a program where everyone had to take penicillin, that would obviously be a great concern to me. Um, and I'll note that two, I'll stand to be corrected on this, at least one, if not two of the 14 recognised deaths by the TGA, two of those people had antiphospholipid syndromes. Now, we know that phospholipid is one of the lipids used in the vaccine, yet the TGA still will not put a warning label on the, on the COVID vaccine to say that if you've got an antiphospholipid syndrome, uh, you may want to think about actually taking this particular vaccine because there's phospholipids in the vaccine. Um, so... You know, it, it's this whole um, uh, ignoring the risk. Uh, that I mean, that, it, that, is, that is, you don't need to be a neurosurgeon to work that out. I mean, it, it, that is really basic medicine. You don't give allergy-inducing components to people that are sensitive to those allergens. It's just... A absolutely. And, and it's this failure to recognise the risk uh, mm. in all of these things. And people try to put, put me into an anti-vaxxer camp or, you know, or, you know put people into anti-vax, pro-vax camps. That's not the question people should be asking. The question is, are your politicians, especially senators, which the Senate's a House of Review, uh, are we asking the right questions in regards to risk uh, mm -hmm. and the reward benefit? And is property, proper quality assurance being taken uh, in regards to the decision-making process? In my view, uh, in regards to COVID and many other things, mind you, but we won't go there tonight, uh, but you know, climate change might be one of them, uh, is... The, the proper empirical method of, you know, testing, 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 getting repeatable observations um, and then applying scepticism, one of the major schools of epistemology, uh, to that process is not taking place because we have a media that, you know, pushes out propaganda and then anyone that tries to refute the propaganda or, or you know, ask legitimate questions are being censored heavily. Uh, and it seems to have accelerated uh, greatly in the last decade. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that you could discuss, you know, different points of view without getting labelled, you know, an anti-vaxxer or a cooker or whatever. 
Yeah. But today, uh, yeah. unfortunately, you know, free free will and free thought just seem to be completely shut down or being yeah, shut. It's, it's science by people with BAs in journalism, isn't it? It's just quite incredible. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah, in 2021, there were 1,125 appointments made at the Adult Vaccine Safety Clinic at the uh, Sir Charles Gardner Hospital in, in Western Australia. So 2021, 1,125 appointments made. In 2020, there was seven. Yeah. Again, I mean, I don't think there's any need to comment on that. But why wasn't this seen as a red flag? It's just uh, incredible. Well, well um, look, I, I know one of those people who went to that clinic, Chantelle Yaron, run, and she was a, a Western Australian police officer in Western Australia, a 30-year-old mm. fit, and health, a fit and healthy uh, female. And I, I don't think she'll mind me mentioning her name tonight. Um, she was told, so she was one of the first people who contacted me with her vaccine injury, and it was the response of the medical community to her injury that, that, sent, you know, that sent off my alarm bells. But she got the Pfizer vaccine, was immediately ill, went to see the doctor on and off for two weeks saying something wasn't right, ended up having a stroke, um, had Bell's palsy, the side of her face was crooked, uh, and then she had to go back to hospital later on and have a serious operation um, on her stomach, I think it was, and was on a potassium drip. She got sent off to the vaccine safety clinic uh, after these injuries, expecting someone to give her counselling and some medical support on how to recover from her injury. And she was actually pressured into taking a second shot. So she walked out. She actually walked out of that injury clinic. And, and that wasn't the only story I heard like that, where they, even after the first injury, they were pressured to take a second injury. But the, the thing is, vaccine, I remember yeah, yeah. Chantel telling me that she wasn't the only one. They were trying to do the same to about three other women uh, who were also in a clinic at the same time in, in, in trying to get to take the second shot. And, and so this, this sort of behaviour is just cruel and unnecessary. So not only was there no red flag um, mm. raised about their number of serious injuries, they, they were willfully ignoring it and, and trying to continue to, uh, in my view, continue to injure these people that were injured from the first one. It just completely yeah. defies logic. It's almost as if they're being pressurised by their managers, isn't it, to do this? It's almost oh, as oh as they had to be. From yeah, yeah it's up. coming from right up top. Um, and, and this is why we, well... I say we need a Royal Commission, uh, and, and I think we do, but I'll, I'll be honest, I'm sceptic that the Royal Commission won't whitewash a lot of this stuff or the terms of reference yeah. will be so narrow that this, these sort of issues aren't raised. Um, but the other alternative is to have a Senate inquiry, and, of course, Labor and the Greens voted against that. The current government voted against having that um, last year when uh, myself and Alex Antic tried to get it moved moved to have a Senate inquiry. And, of course, the reason for that is is that there's people like myself and Senator Alex Antic and Matt Canavan who would ask the hard questions that would, would embarrass, you know, not just the current Labor government, uh, but also ourselves. Mm -hmm. I want to just, just read you a direct quote from this, uh, from this report here, from the Western Australian report. Adverse events of special interest... Uh, were monitored by the department during the COVID-19 vaccination program. So adverse events of special interest were monitored. And they mentioned under those adverse events that were being specially monitored during the role are anaphylaxis, thrombosis to thrombocytopenic syndrome, immune thrombocytopenia, and a few others, Guillain-Barre, myocarditis, pericarditis, myocarditis. Now, given that they knew to specially monitor these in 2021, does that not mean that they knew that these were a problem in 2021? Yet again, I mean, you know, they, they were ignoring the very evidence yeah. in front of their eyes. Yeah. Um, and, right. you know, it, it, there's no other word for it. It's just blatant and reckless negligence, at the very least. I mean, I could possibly say a few more other things, but I won't. Um, but, you know, the evidence yeah. was right there. And, and as I... That, that's what they, they, they knew the they knew to look out for these side effects so yeah probably on there ticking them off saying when they occurred rather than saying just a minute let's stop these side effects from occurring in the first place yeah yeah i, I can't answer why john other than the fact that there must have been a lot of coercion from above uh to to not look at you know yeah. not not deal and acknowledge these injuries Senator, it's the end of a working day. Thank you so much for your time. I have one final question, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, you, you, you've been questioning this whole COVID narrative and the vaccine narrative. 
Um, has there been any uh, adverse effects on you and your and your political career from the, from the heroic stance that you've taken? Oh well, look, I lost my pre-selection uh, about nine days ago, so I won't be running again in Parliament. Well, I could, I could leave the party and run as an independent. Um, I don't really want to do that because I don't think that running as an independent. I don't want to, you, you know, in politics, the brutal the brutal fact of politics is it's a numbers game. And I'd rather be in a party that can eventually govern so I can influence the outcomes and be a yeah. part of the solution yeah. uh, rather than sit on the sidelines and, and um, complain from the sidelines. Now, there's an important role, uh, I think, for crossbenchers and, and the Senate to apply a sceptic role. But, you know, I got into politics originally because, you know, I've got major issues with our tax act and our monetary policy that favours offshore profits, profits going offshore. And it's the same in the UK, uh, yeah. by the way. Um, you know, I know some of the tax structures in Guernsey and Jersey, and you know, your your your, your wheat oh, tears are blood. Ta- tax is tax is just for little people. Yeah, yeah, you'd, you'd wheat yeah, tears are yeah. blood. If Important you need to people some don't of the pay great, tax. You know, <laughs> yeah. My good friends in Britain have been ripped off as well. But um, uh, um, so you know, yeah, look, look, I want to be part of the solution. Unfortunately, I took this stand, and I think it has worked against me. But I have to live with myself. Uh, I know I did the right thing by the people and our party values. Um, unfortunately, some people use that against me to say that somehow I was disloyal to the party. I completely disagree with that. I thought I was loyal to the people. I think, and ultimately, party is a means to an end, which is to protect the people. Uh, I'm an unashamed protectionist. I hate neoliberalism. Uh, and, um, you know, look, all I can do is, is try my hardest, which I did. Uh, and hopefully, you know, I've still got two years to go and hopefully we can, yeah. you know, try and get some justice for those who've, who've, who've suffered a great deal of harm. Uh, as a result of the injuries and the mandates. And I know, I know your stance has commanded a lot of respect and, and gratitude from Australia and, and, and people around the world. I'm getting feedback from around the world. People are, are grateful. So, Senator, we've taken quite enough of your evening. I hope you can get home and have some tea now. Uh, thank you for your time and uh, thank you for your insights and, and thank you for your self-sacrifice that you've done for this. It's, uh, yeah. it's appreciated yeah, well, look, by look, people right, around Thanks the world. very much, John. Look, I, I never lost my job or got injured throughout all of this period. and So I, I've been very lucky. It's those people who have been injured and, and lost their health and lost their mm-hmm. income uh, that, you know, have really suffered. Um, you know, my, my loss is, is very small compared to theirs. But thanks very much for your support. I really appreciate that. Yeah, uh, and you know, I look forward to keeping in touch with you and your and, and you know, your listeners. Yeah, thank thank you, Senator. We appreciate it. Thanks, John. Have a great night. Thank, or thank great you. morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's morning yeah. for us. Yes.